So bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, today's class, I'm going to use it as a class to understand uh, how we understand a uh, methodology, right? Um, and so uh, today's class is very important from that perspective. It's very important to understand how, uh, how particularly the Quranic methodology of Sheikh Imran Hussain. So, you know, there have been concerns about some things he said, so I want to clarify them and also answer uh, a very respected, a very noble, a very pious, a very muttaqi uh, scholar. But sometimes scholars, you know, they have difference of opinions. Imam Bukhari didn't get along with uh, Imam Muhanifa, even though they were, of course, 150 years apart. But, you know, sometimes scholars like Imam Ghazali wrote uh, not very light, nicely about uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Bukhari didn't have a very good opinion about Imam Abu Hanifa. And so the point being that sometimes scholars have a misunderstanding because every scholar has his method in which he understands things. And that sometimes makes things confusing. So I am 100% sure that in the case of uh, uh, Mulana Hassan Ali, may Allah bless him, because uh, I benefited uh, from him. Uh, I saw his series of the names of Allah, which were very beautiful. And so I'm going to respond kind of on behalf of uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein here <coughs> in this conversation. So to be fair, I'm going to let Sheikh Hassan speak. And then after that, I'm going to respond to the points that I think are particularly important. Okay. So let's try to do that, inshallah. And then this will help you understand the methodology. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brothers and sisters, yes, I am here to talk about uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein. And some of you will say, well, why don't I meet him in private and so on? Yes, I met him. Uh, after several years of listening to his claims, many of his claims, which I felt some of those claims were uh, in contradiction to how we've understood the Quran and Sunnah. So I met him yesterday, 26th of September 2021, uh, and I presented some of his arguments to him. And I was actually quite taken aback by his responses because, you know, he clearly believes uh, in, in, in many things which, which 1450 years of scholarship that is behind us is in total, you know, disagreement with the Sheikh. And I'm going to present some of these things to you. Okay, so as far as that's concerned, there is one important point here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaq wa fi anfusihim. We will show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves. Hatta until yatabayyana until it is clear annahul haq that this Quran is the absolute truth. This includes Islamic eschatology. You see, the if you're talking about halal and haram and things of the past, then you can't contradict the ijma, the consensus. But if you're giving interpretation for something of the future, or you have new knowledge that will come in the future, uh, for example, issues that relate to Quran and some issues of science, um, if there is an exfoliation of knowledge, meaning it's not contradicting. So if I say, for example, uh, the Quran said, Al nunajika bi badanika. Today we will save you in your badan, meaning in your body. Litakuna ayatalina. So you'll be a sign for the people in the future. So now when the body frown comes, and I say, see, this is the verse referring to this. So this is not in contradiction to the things of the past. The things that would be in contradiction to the past, or the aqaid of the past, or the fiqh of the past, of course. If somebody comes up with something totally new in regards to halal and haram in Islamic law, then that could be questionable. But there's absolutely no doubt. The Prophet said the wonders of Quran will never finish. And this is actually a necessity of the fact that it's a living miracle, the Quran. So the miracles of Quran will continue. So we have to define here is the problem that we're having a problem of interpretation of something new? Uh, like let's say Quran and embryology, uh, 
the Quran says, "Ash-shams wal qamaru, wa shams tajlili mustaqarrilha," and the sun is moving in its orbit to a, a settled place, to a final destination. And if I find out, oh, the sun is actually moving uh, along with the galaxies and the whole the galaxy is all moving in one direction and our solar system is all moving in one direction in the direction the sun is going in, I can then say that I think this connects with Quran, something that was not said in the past. So we have to be, and then when it comes to Islamic eschatology, if I see tall buildings, I'll say, oh, the prophet said there will be tall buildings. So here they are. So that's not something that was said in the past, that we have tall buildings today, like the way the Prophet, because there was never a time where the Arabs made tall buildings like the way we do now, like the Khalifa Burj now. So obviously, this interpretation of saying, and I want this to be very clear, the absolute knowledge, absolute, what we know absolutely, qat'i mutlaq, okay? Those things that are qat'i, those things that are mutlaq, are things la ilaha illallah, or the things of aqaid, that the angels exist, jahannam exists, the hellfire exists, jannah exists, right? In the things of the aqaid, you have to, it's fault to know them yourself. You have to personally answer on, when you're in your grave, you have to answer who's your Lord, who's your deen, who's your prophet, sallallahu You have to know the basics of imaniyat and the basics of aqaid, for yourself is far. You have to know as a Muslim certain things, absolute things. Meeting you is haq on the day of judgment. But when it comes to, for example, how to pray, how to do wudu, I'm not responsible that I have to search every single hadith and construct my understanding and knowledge of this is how I have to pray, this is how I have to do wudu, this is how I do the miswak, this is how I... No, I can follow somebody. It's enough for me to say, I followed somebody who I think knew what they were talking about, or I followed some valid Islamic scholarship when it comes to fiqh issues. But when it comes to imaniyat, your iman, you're, you're not allowed to say, oh, well, I believe because they believe. So then therefore I believe. That, no, you're personally responsible for knowing the issues of aqidah, the issues of iman. You have to know them for yourself to answer for yourself on the day of judgment. Okay, number one. Number two, when it comes to, so the only, so there are things that are qat'i, absolute, and that there are things that are not absolute. And that there are things that are absolute, that are not absolute, that are true, but they're just not absolute. So Allah is la ilaha illallah, absolute. Jannah, absolute. Jahannam, absolute. The day of judgment, absolute. Uh, the, uh, the Quran talks about um, the sun and the moon following an exact calculated path. This conversation is not absolute. It's an interpretation. It's a ta'wil, right? I'm connecting this sun and this moon to this ayah and saying they're following a calculated path, and this is how this path is, and it's this much, and so on and so forth. This is, it is true. As far as we know, it's true. It's a fact. But it's not qata'i. It's not the same level of knowledge and knowing as you have to know, la ilaha illallah, or jannah, or jahannam. So let me make a distinction here. The things that are absolutely qata'i, of course you can't disagree with. The Quran is the book of Allah. No doubt about this. Okay. But those things that which you have to give an interpretation for Islamic law. The Prophet said, if you eat camel meat, you have to do wudu. Or the Prophet, it's wrong, uh, astaghfirullah. The pro, a companion of the Prophet asked the Prophet who ate camel meat, do I have to do wudu after eating the camel meat? And the Prophet said, yes. Or the Prophet did wudu after eating camel meat. Now you can interpret that that if you eat camel meat, does he break your wudu? Or was it that he had no wudu and then he chose to eat first and then do wudu to pray? You can give your interpretation. If uh, So fiqhi issues, it's not absolute. But we know some things from a fiqhi perspective are, are absolute in a sense. We know you have to aqimu salah. Allah said, establish the prayer. So it's a command. It's absolute. In terms of the hukum Allah gave, it's absolute in the sense Allah said, do this. That's 
you know, it's, it's a command. But that's at, not at the level of aqidah. One is, you can say, mutlaq, qat'i, mutlaq, absolutely, absolute, la ilaha illallah. Right? And then there are things that are qat'i in a sense that when you look at the wordings of Allah, Allah is saying, do this or don't do this, it's absolute. Okay? Then there are those things that are dhanni, that we think this is the way, because there's more than one opinion, we're choosing one opinion. If I say that, uh, you know, there's ikhtilaf upon reading Fatiha or not reading Fatiha, this is not a qat'i issue per se from the perspective of sulud din and asulul fiqh, not fiqh. It's not qat'i, it's dhanni. You can, your ikhtiyar, okay. When you're giving interpretation or we're giving interpretation that this hadith has this meaning, especially when it has to do with Islamic eschatology, none of that really falls into qat'i. It's not qat'i. It's not like you have to know that, like you have to know the day of judgment or you have to know la ilaha illallah, so on and so forth. But what does the Prophet teach us? If you look at the hadith of hadith of Jibreel, where the Prophet came and Jibreel asked him the questions, asked about Islam and Iman and Ihsan and the signs of the hour. Islam gives you your fiqh, your rules and regulations. Iman are the absolute, absolute, absolute things. Okay. Islam is the Sharia, the law. How do you, how do you live? What rules? What are the principles? What are the the maqasid of the Sharia? What are the is the intent of the Sharia? Right. They have to protect life, protect wealth, so on and so forth. So that's Islam. Iman is the absolute. What do we really believe in? What do we know about the unseen world? Okay. And this is absolutely knowledge that everybody has to have for themselves. Absolutely. This is key to salvation. Then is Ihsan. How do I get close to Allah? How do I get close to Allah? How do I get close to Allah? Then if now the fourth one is, since you're living in dunya, this is where you have to put your seeds. This is where every moment of this life is potentially infinite for the next life. This is where you put your seeds. Now, here, you're living here, Islam goes up and down. Iman is uh, absolute. Getting close to Allah also has different needs based upon what? The circumstance. Okay, so now I, I'm not going to go into details of this because I don't want to start talking about this. But now the fourth part, the signs of the Day of Judgment, is that a person of Basira, if you have, because it starts with Islam, which is the lowest level, then Iman, then Ihsan, and the highest is that what? That you're able to see you have Basira and understanding of where you're sitting in history and what Allah wants from you in this point in history. What is the work Allah wants from you? Okay, what does Allah want you to do? And what are the dangers to the Islam of the people, the Iman of the people, the Ihsan of the people? What are the dangers to that? What are the opportunities for that? And so that is a higher level. Just like Islam is like you have to pray five times a day, right? So that's fard. But the Hajjud has more reward, more closeness. So it's the same way. There are things that every Muslim has to be doing anyway. You have to live according to the sunnah. You have to, uh, uh, so this you can say is the level of basira. If you want me to give some word to it, ihsan. And then ihsan, highest level of ihsan is where you really have uh, basira. Basira is now you know where you're living and your understanding of the times you're living in. Okay. And so you have, but salah is far. You have to pray far. But if you're praying tahajjud, it's a higher level. But the higher level is not fard. The, fi the higher levels are not fard. But it's fard that there are some people in every society that have that higher level. Just like it's fard upon every society that there has to be some doctor. It's upon, fard upon every society. It's fard al kafai is what it's called. So you need some people who, have, who are at that level of so closeness to Allah that people can see, oh, this is what it's like to be with somebody who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And so, why am I saying this? I'm saying this so that people understand that there's no denying the past, but things of the future, if you have basira, 
if you have insight, if you have ihsan, if you have closeness to Allah, then Allah can show things or reveal things from his book, his living book, and give you new ajaib, new treasures from the Quran that were never known before, never discovered before, but they won't be in contradiction to the things of the past. So th there'll be no like something, oh, I discovered in the Quran that we don't have to pray five times a day. No, that won't happen. But there may be something in the Quran where like, oh, this ayah was referring to this type of situation. That's possible. Okay. So now let's just continue inshallah here. Please, guys, all of you, please understand there's an area of concern here. Don't talk to me about other stuff. Like yesterday, I uploaded this video about Tamim Mudar radiallahu anhu, hadith of Muslim 2942, when he went to an island and he saw, you know, the Jal there and, and you know, Sheikh claimed, Sheikh Imran Hussein claimed that that is Great Britain. When I posted that, some of you said, well, you know, Sheikh, you know, he spoke, you know, you don't know the history about um, Britain as Sheikh does. Look, that's not the area of concern, all right? Sheikh has given you a lot of historical facts over the years. Fine. I'm not here to discuss that. That's fine. You know, you can discuss about um, America, about Sheikh saying about Britain, about Israel, about the formation of Israel, about the Balfour Agreement, about, you know, the Jal ruling from, you know, that part of the earth, Palestine or Jerusalem from ruling from there. We know all of this. I'm not, I'm not contending any of that. All right. About the historical facts. What's my area of concern? My area of concern is when after narrating all of that, you've got this hadith. And we quote the hadith and you say this hadith meant this. Where Prophet ﷺ never said that, Sahaba never said that, the scholars never said that. That's where the area of concern is. How did you come up with that? And this is your conjecture, these are your thoughts. So Sheikh said, you know, some of you said Sheikh said that um he, you know, Tamir Dar Rabbi saw it as a vision. He saw the island as a vision or a dream. Look, the hadith never said that. No scholar ever said that. So where did you bring that up from? When the Sheikh said the Jal was in, some of you said, well, the Jal was in Britain. Not that he is in Britain and that the Dajjal went to Washington or something later on. Where did the Sheikh get that from? Where okay, so this is a good point that uh, Sheikh Hassan raises. So how do we understand this? The, the fact that this was a vision, actually some of the classical scholars do narrate. I don't have the proof with me right now because I was... Uh, going to talk about this from a different perspective. As far as it being a the interpretation that it's a dream, uh, I will share with you some things, and then I will share with you what some of the scholars have said. Look, the Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam," in the riwayah of this hadith. The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam," "Hadathani hadithan wafiqa." الذي كنت أحدثكم. تميم أدارمي. He told me something that agrees with what I have been telling you. This is what the Prophet said, صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now, when the narration is being mentioned, right? Uh, what does he say about the Jal? He said about the uh, Jal that he was a big huge uh, gigantic big huge gigantic human being that he had never like seen such a great strong human being ever like that uh, right ever before okay he he said about him uh, let me see uh, So the Prophet said, whatever I told you about him, it agrees with him. Now, when he talks about the Jal, okay, uh, what does he, what do they say? Uh, he was so huge and big of a human being. That we ever saw before nobody bigger than him. Khalqan. Okay. In terms of creation, in his built, he was well built person. Okay, so the Prophet is saying he what he's saying agrees with what I have told you, and he is saying, and the Prophet said he has crooked legs, he's short, he's staunchy, right? Uh, he has one eye, 
uh, so on and so forth. But this is like a well-built human being. So what, why, in some narrations, and many, many scholars have talked about this, and maybe one day I'll bring out, you know, dig out the resources for this. But some narrations say, describe him one way, and this hadith alone describes him in a different way. Okay, this hadith alone uh, signal it's authentic, but it describes in a different way, different from all the other narrations. And one of the ways to bring it together is to say, well, maybe it was a dream. Some scholars have said, for example, I'll show you that, uh, you know, uh, for example, إن الحديث جساسة من أمور الغيب التي يجب إيمان بها. Okay, so the this hadith because it is not in coherence with other narrations and the prophet said he's saying what i've been telling you and we don't find any narration of the prophet that describes the jal in the way that the mim adarmi uh described so one way to reconcile this is that perhaps it was not a real event that would contradict what Tamim al-Darmi saw as Dajjal which versus what the Prophet described as Dajjal. But if you bring them together, reconcile them, then that was actually a dream. Okay? And it, again, it's not Qat'i. It's Dhanni. It's something that could be. There's a possibility of that. And then, let's continue, inshallah ta'ala, on this. That is that if we assume that this was a vision, then every dream has an interpretation, right? Every dream has an interpretation, and because every dream has an interpretation. So in this dream, the person, Tamim Adarmi, he has a dream that he's in an island, and that island has a Dijjal in it inside what? A monastery. I can show you the hadith, but if Sheikh Hassan's listening to this, he'll know that this part is 100% correct. Okay. So now, what is a Jew doing inside a monastery? What is the purpose of showing an island in a dream? Okay. So this is the contention that I'm not only, this is the only point that I need to dig the books and show that, that I don't have with me. The rest of everything, inshallah, I have. Okay. So let's assume Okay, so now in a dream you see an island, right? So now Britain is an island. And now he's saying, Sheikh Imran is saying, that look, this is the island that gave birth to Dijal. Why? Because it gave birth to Israel. This is the island that gave birth to the modern economic system to the Bank of London. This is the island that gave birth to feminism. This is the island that gave birth to the sexual revolution. This is the island that gave birth to um, the, 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 the Royal Science Society, okay? This is the uh, island that gave birth to Israel. This is the island that gave birth to all those things that are manifesting, everything from the Royal Science of Society to the sexual revolution, to the banking uh, industry that we have in the world currently. It all started from England. It all started from an island. And he's saying, I think that dream that he had or that vision that he had or that uh, event that he had, okay, is, uh, is what? Is referring to what? Is referring to the place of England or Scotland or this whole area, okay? Now, the person who knows the history will see that there's definitely, it's not qata'i, it's not absolute. It's not something someone can say, it's like la ilaha illallah, no. But it is something that is dhanni. It, it does have a basis and a merit when you say this, that, hey, yes, there is an island. They took over the whole world and then retract back into that island. And one of the things that happened is Christianity and Judaism merged into a single civilization called the Judeo-Christian civilization. It's not Qatari. It's not absolute. It's not like la ilaha illallah. It's not like knowing the day of judgment. It's not like knowing that they're angels. It's not like knowing like 
uh, any of the things that are absolute in terms of imaniyat, where the Quran spells it out clearly. Over here, I also want to mention, there are things Quran spells out clearly, and there are things that Quran leaves unclear. And then there are those things that are absolutely unclear. And then there are those things that are absolutely clear, as mentioned to al Imran, right? So there are the things that are what? Absolutely clear, muhkamat, right? Hunna umul kitab, that's the main part of the book. Believe in Allah, that's the main part of the book. And then there are things that are like very not clear at all. And the people that have a problem in their heart follow those things that are not clear, okay? Uh, giving knighthood to gay musical, okay, yeah. So you can think of all the th wrong things that came out of England, right? Rock, all of that, okay? So now the point is that no one is going to say this is qat'i and absolute knowledge like la ilaha illallah or knowing jannah or jahannam or something like this. If you're Ahlul Basira, if you're people of Basira, then you're going to be able to fix, the, you're going to be able to see the dots and you're going to see how they connect. And so it's not absolute, not, like you're not required to know physics, but somebody has to know physics, okay? So the point is, is that um, if you have the Basira, then you can begin to see the uh, connections. Now, this island that had a Jewish man in the monastery, which is the merging of the Jewish uh, and the Christian civilization. And so now Israel is part of the Western civilization, so to say. So this is an interpretation that one man called Sheikh Amran Hussein is giving. Could he be wrong? Yes, he could be wrong. That's why we don't say it's qat'i. La ilaha illallah cannot be wrong. Quran is the book of Allah cannot be wrong. The angels cannot be wrong. Those things can't be wrong. But can an interpretation someone is giving, can it be wrong? Yes, it can be wrong. Is it possible that we totally didn't get it? Yes, it's possible. And that's why we hold on firmly to the things that are muhkamat. So there are things that are shady. We don't know what they mean at all. Things, for example, about Allah's attributes or Allah's actions or that Allah will show his shin on the day of judgment, for example. We don't know what that means. We stay away from that. And then there are other things that Allah alludes to as if, does Allah allude to something? Because Allah is like, well, it's not, I'm, I'm just going to say Zulqarnain, but don't go into the details of who he is. Or does Allah, because this is the Quran is literature, right? And the best of literature, does Allah allude to something? So it's like a mystery that people will actually look into it. Or does Allah allude to something because Allah is saying, look, don't, don't go into the, I, I didn't mention more details because it's unnecessary. So the point, uh, so the point is that uh, it goes both ways. When the result of both is the same. If you say, look, we don't know, Allah knows best, we don't have to go into it. Okay, don't go into Zul Qarnayn. But some people, they want to. And the Quran encourages because Allah says, Afala yatadabbarun al Quran. Afala yatadabbarun al Quran. Do not ponder over the Quran. Do not think deeply about, about the Quran. That means the things that Allah is hinting towards, look into them, go into them, investigate them. Right? So if you are the type, that wants to ponder over Quran, then something will catch your curiosity and you'll think about it. Now, let's go back to uh, the talk, okay? Wherever the Jal is at this moment, where did the Sheikh get that from? Which island is? Some of you are asking me, well, tell us what island it is because Islam is so holistic, it must have explained everything. Listen, get out of your, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, you know, jacket or suit. Get out of that, right? Well, we've got a heritage here, Quran, Sunnah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no hadith that we've got in our hands tells us what island that is. So why should I or any scholar say what island that is? Yeah, and if you're going to say that it's Great Britain or some other island, it's your conjecture, it's your, it's your imagination. It's something that you interjected. And so, yeah, over here uh, to the dear respected uh, Sheikh, um, Sheikh Hassan Ali, this is where I would disagree. Zanni, when something is zanni, or you make an interpretation, or you make a ta'wil, it's based upon knowledge. Otherwise, it's not even knowledge. It's not even anything, right? If it's conjecture, the word, it's then, even though, interestingly enough, 
uh, even though in fiqh and in other alums we use the word qati in dhanni, but in the Quran the word dhanni actually means uh, it comes in both senses. Inni dhanantu, uh, I thought for sure mulaqiya hisabiya that I will have my day of judgment, right? So the word dhan in the Quran means I'm absolutely sure, and the word dhan also means not sure at all. So, but like hawa or tilka amaniyuhum, these are their conjectures. We're not talking about, there's a difference between uh, absolute knowledge, like la ilaha illallah, and having knowledge and interpretation that has the possibility of being wrong. The whole of fiqh is like that. The whole of Islamic law is like that. The only part of Islam that is absolutely absolute is the imaniyat, that you have to know for absolute certain. That Allah is one, for example, that as Allah is al qahar and that there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. Or the day of judgment will happen. Those are absolutes. Those never, ever, ever, there's no possibility of change. That is the knowledge, meaning that's absolute knowledge. But for example, in salah, we can have a different opinion. It's not absolute. It, it comes under the category of dhani. Then there are things that are hawa, or they are these are their conjectures. When somebody is taking the Quran and then taking real events and connecting them, or he's taking a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and connecting it, when he's connecting these two things, then this, as long as the connection is done properly with a proper methodology, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, as long as that connection is done properly, then it is at least it is in the domain of dhanni. It's ta'wil. It could be right, could be wrong. Sheikh Imran Hussain could be right, he could be wrong. But if he has basira and Allah has led him to understand something, oh, maybe he could be right also. That's for the people of knowledge to determine that what he has brought together here, this hadith, these events, do they fit together? This has nothing to do with denying anything in the past. Now let's continue. And you have to admit to that. And that's my concern about Sheikh Iman Hussein and many of his claims. That he, he might give you many facts, okay? I might agree with those facts about the historical things that, that, that happened in the past. But when it comes to the hadith of the Quran and he makes his conjecture or his thought, he adds that in. I have to point it out. And I want you, the viewers, to also be able to say, well, you know, that's not something which the Prophet ﷺ said or the Sahaba said. Now, we've got a number of these things which, which Sheikh Iman Hussein, you know, brings up. It's not just about this hadith about Tamim al-Dar radiallahu anhu and, and, you know, the island being Great Britain. Um, let's just talk about the jasad, okay? So what is, what is this I'm talking about? Let's look at surah number 38, um, ayah number 34, where Allah Azza wa Jal, he says that he tested Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam and that he placed on his throne a body, okay? A body. Now, what is this body? It's in the Quran, you'll see the word jasad. Now, Sheikh Imran Hussein claims that this jasad was Dajjal. So he's saying that Dajjal was on the throne of Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam and, he's, and, and he sat there. Where did he get that from? No tafsir mentioned that. No person mentioned that. When I asked Sheikh Imran Hussein yesterday... Actually, uh, with all due respect to our Sheikh, and he is far more closer to Allah than me, but because this is an academic discussion, so then, you know, uh, a pious person can be wrong on some issues. It's not true that Noam Fasir has mentioned it. Okay. I'm going to give you one example. Uh, this, because there are other sources too, but this is the closest source I had in front of me right now. So this is a, 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 a you could say, a compilation of different tafsirs in English. Okay. It's called the study Quran. Okay. And, uh, uh, the study Quran, okay? If you go, subhanAllah, I just missed it. Uh, if you go to ayah number 34 over here, I'm just going to read to you. The trial faced by Suleiman is difficult to discern, meaning it's hard to tell what is this talking about. And I'm going to show you that how Sheikh Imran Hussain's methodology kind of works. So today you'll get a kind of a taste of it. The trial faced by Suleiman is difficult to discern, most likely refers to some manner to which 
his sovereignty was stolen by the jinn when a Satan, meaning any jinn, okay, referring to an evil jinn, was placed upon his throne. Okay, so the idea that it was more than, uh, or it could be something other than what? It could be something other than the story in which his son was uh, born uh, after he went and had intimacy with like all these uh, women. Uh, and then his son was born uh, in a way that uh, he was uh, paralyzed. Now, when we look at the Quran and this particular situation, first of all, one tafsir definitely mentions it. Not one tafsir, but some tafsirs. When I was in class, I didn't have some of these references with me. So over here, for example, in, uh, in this tafsir, okay, uh, it clearly says on وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ Suleiman, uh, it says اِبْتَلَيْنَاهُ اِمْتِحَانُهُ بِسُلْبِ مُلْكِهِ we tested him with taking away his kingship. وَالْقَيْنَ عَلَى كُرْسِهِ أَيْ عَلَى سَرِيرِهِ جَسَدًا فِيهَا قَوْلًا There are two statements about what jasad is. Okay, إِحْدَاهُمَا أَنَّهُ shaytan. One, the first statement is that it's a shaytan. It was a shaytan. فَقَالَ لَهُ إِبْنْ عَبَّاسِ And this is the opinion of Ibn Abbas. And according to this Mufassir, وَجَمْحُورِ and the majority of the scholars, he says. Uh, ismi shaytan thalatha. As far as the name of this shaytan is concerned, there are three. Ahdahuma Sahrun. And one of the, uh, and Ibn Abbas says his name was Sahrun. Maridan Lam li Sulaiman. He was one of the jinns that Sulaiman didn't have control over. Wathani, and the other name is Asif. And that is the uh, Mufassir Mujahid, who is also a student of Ibn Abbas. Allah innahu laysa bi mu'min. He wasn't a mu'min. Alladhi indahu ismul a'lam. But he had the greatest name of Allah with him, by which he can do things. Uh, illa an uh, abghada. And, and some of the Mufassirin didn't uh, take to this one. Wa annahu asif was his uh, other name. Alladhi indahu ilmu min kitab. He's the one who had the knowledge of the book who was able to make the Arsha of uh, Balqis come. Uh, so, إِنَّهُ لَمَّا فَتَنَ Sulaiman. So he put Sulaiman in a trial in which the fell, the ring on his hand fell that had the name of Allah on it, the Ismul Azam. فَلَمْ يُثَبِّدْ فَقَالَ Asif, And then he said to him, أَنَا أَقُومُ مَقَامِكْ I I will not uh, I will stand from your place. Your I've taken control of your like seat. I'll stand from your place. Ila uh, antuba ilallah ilayk ilay so until you don't do tawbah. So he did uh, tawbah to Allah and the jinn went away. Uh, and then many people said this is not true, but the qawl of Ibn Abbas is this was a shaytan. So I just wanted this proof to be there, that it is in the textbooks. It's not, and now when we look at the hadith, you'll see if you had to choose between these two qawls, which one you would choose and which one makes more sense. It's even available in English, uh, tafsirs, the more recent ones. Okay, number two, if you, now you have two things you can look at. You can look at the context of the ayah and you can then also look at the word jasad in Quran. And this is what I want to share with you in terms of methodology, how uh, Sheikh Imran is thinking. Uh, so let me, uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, let me get this. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So let me. He said, yes, nobody's ever mentioned. So let me, so. I, I don't know if Sheikh Imran was saying he must have, uh, you know, because he's old and he may not remember, but he has must have uh, heard of this tafsir from other, from other sources too. But I want to now share with you how this all comes about within the Quran. Okay, so you can have a better better understanding of the methodology that is being used. 
Okay. Okay. So Allah says in ayah number 34, لَقَدْ فَتَنَّ سُلَيْمَانِ And we tested Sulaiman. وَأَلْقَيْنَا Alqa, the word alqa in the Quran is also used for inspiration and revelation. Okay, let me give you an example of that. Uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is in many, many places in the Quran, but I'm going to give you just an example so people understand, because the literal meaning of the word alqa is to place or to throw, like when Musa alayhi threw the staff, for example. Okay, so... Uh, over here, ayah number 37, Baqarah, and if you see the translation, and when Adam received words from his Lord, okay? So, talaqa, talaqi means to meet someone, it means to receive something from someone, and uh, but throw, it also means to throw something, okay? Uh, and over here, alqayna is being translated as placed, is to put, okay? But alqayna also means to give inspiration and revelation, as I just showed you. Ala kursihi, over his kursi, jasadan. Now, what, what we're saying is there's no word in Quran that comes for any word in Quran that also comes in another place of Quran. They're all interconnected. See, if the word jasad comes here, if the word jasad comes for another person or another situation, they have to be interconnected because Quran does not use synonymous words. I'll give you an example. Imra'a means wife. Zoj also means spouse, wife. But when Allah uses the word zoj, it has a positive meaning. Imra'a has a biological or a negative meaning. Like, وَمْرَأَتُهُ حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ Imra'atul الْفِرْعَونِ, for example. So, uh, or, for example, Sirat versus Tariq versus Sabil. They all have different, they're the same word, but have different connotations of the same word. And Quran doesn't use, you know, how you write a book. So you, use, you don't want to use the same word over and over again. So instead of saying good, next time I'll say another word for good, uh, proper. And next time I'll say, I don't want to repeat the same word over and over again. We're writing an essay. You want to use, you know, some different words for the same basic meaning. Quran's not like this. If the Quran uses a word, it means that word. And it doesn't mean anything other than that word. So I'm going to come to that, but let's just go over the context here. So even the context. So first of all, it is in a tafsir. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 34, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمَانَ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِهِ جَسَدًا ثُمَّ أَنَاب So we placed upon his kursi, his throne, okay, uh, a body. Okay, which body? We don't know what body. Somebody. Okay, thumma, and then he repented to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay, qala rabbiq fili, and he said, Allah forgive me, wahabli mulkan, and give me a kingdom. La yambagi li ahadim min baadi. Give me a kingdom that no one else can have after me. Innaka antal wahab, because you're the best of the ones who give gift. Now, after this, Allah mentions, okay, then we gave him this and we gave him this. So, like, for example, lahu rih, and we put under his control the winds, tajri bi amri, and they would move by his command, rikha'an, okay, and gently, okay, haythu asab, wherever he told them to go. Was shaytan, and the shayateen, all of them were put in his control. Kullu bana'in. All of them that were builders of these pyramids that you see after one culture after another, okay. Well, was and divers that would go into the ocean, okay. And others that, that were put into change, bil asfad, okay. And uh, now this was our gift, okay. Now, what is the point of if the if you are looking at the Quran, okay, if you're, if you're saying to me, he did this dua and got all these things because something happened to his son, or 
which is a mutawatir hadith, by the way, which I'm going to talk about in a second. How can we, sometimes we can, sometimes we resolve two contradictory things into one, which I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So, so he did dua to Allah, Allah, give me a kingship no one else has. Why did he do this dua? When he saw something specifically on his chair, what was it placed on the chair or was it some inspiration he got while he saw something on the chair? Why is the word jasad used for a living thing? Because now, when you want to understand Sheikh Imran Hussein's methodology, what is the most important used word used for Isa alayhi The most common word used in the Quran for Prophet Isa alayhi Ruh. Ruhul Qudus. Wa ayyadanahu bi Ruhul Qudus. Wa ayyadanahu bi Ruhul Qudus. Wa ayyadanahu bi Ruhul Qudus. Now, this is not qat'i knowledge. This is dhanni. But I am assuming, based upon solid evidence, that the, av, the opposite of jasad is ruh. The opposite of jasad is ruh. And if this assumption of mine is correct, because Allah gave me some basira, some understanding, then could it be, as some of the tafsirs say, that this was a type of jinn, a type of jasad, a type of being that had no ruh, had no ruh, a type of being that had no ruh? Is it possible? that there? And if, if he saw something that would be sitting on his throne as a challenge to him, then he did dua to Allah, Allah give me a kingship no one else can have. And that is why now every shaitan is running to make a kingdom like Sulaiman So it's not at as, as so now, now the, this is the first part is looking at the context of the, looking at the context of the ayat. Okay. That, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that we put in his control every shaitan. Did he see something on the chair that has to do with the shayateen? Okay. And there are many other questions that are that you can derive from this thought. But there's another thing you can do. I want to understand this word jasad because I'm not clear. I want to understand it from the Quran first before I look at the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, so that I can understand, listen to what I'm saying, so I can understand the sunnah also in a more better way. Because the better you understand the Quran, the better you'll understand the sunnah of the Prophet. So now, let me go to, for example, Quran corpus, and uh, let me look up the word jasad. Okay? So <coughs> the word jasad is also used for what? The cow that Samari, the magician made, which is a long discussion in itself. But this person, the Samari magician, made something that was of a jasad, and he was a magician. And we know the connection between Suleiman and jinns, so therefore magic, because jinn and magic are interrelated. But I'm just pointing out something, oh, connection. Okay, So Jasad is something that is has the outer part, right? And uh, it's missing this, the ruh, the spirit, you can say. There's another explanation, but I'm not going to give that right now. You also have the ayah, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمَانَ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِهِ جَسَدًا Okay? And then, uh, and then, وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُنُونَ التَّعَامُ And we haven't made them a body, okay, that does not eat food. And they're living forever. Okay, so it, it, Allah didn't make you a jasad, something with no ruh that would leave your body. You are not just a jasad. You have a ruh and something to do with the ruh and jasad that if it was just jasad, you would not, you could live forever. And we'll go into this verse later on, maybe some other time. But the point is, it's, it seems that it's pretty clear the word jasad, when you look at it throughout the Quran, the common meaning is something that is just the outer form, not the inner form. Okay, so that now you have two things. You have the Quranic text. You have the word that you're looking at and that every word in Quran is there for a reason. 
And if you read Sheikh Imran Hussein's books, for example, it becomes very clear what? It becomes very clear. He uses this methodology in almost everything. This particular methodology of looking at the words and their interconnections. Why is the word jasad used here? Why is the word jasad used here? Why is the word jasad used here? Ruh is the opposite of jasad. So therefore, there is a connection between them. Ruh al-Qudus, or wa'ayyadanahu bi ruh al-Qudus, and we strengthened him with the ruh al-Qudus versus uh, jasad. So this is how she, he could be wrong. He could be wrong, but he could also be right because he has a methodology he is following. So either there's something wrong with the method. If I say to you, I look at all the words jasad in Quran and see what's common between them. Do you find anything wrong with that met methodology? You may be wrong in the description of that word. Okay, that's a separate issue. But as methodology, just said this in this ayah, this ayah, this ayah, this ayah, or the word qariya is in this ayah, this ayah, this ayah, this ayah, this ayah. Are they, how are they interconnected? Okay, or if I look at, for example, just as another example, the word sirat, 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 sirat versus sabil, 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 sabil. And I say, okay, sirat is for this reason, it seems, and sabil is for this reason. But understanding that because they're separate words, they have different meanings, even though my interpretation of those meanings could be possibly wrong. But whether right or wrong, it still falls under the category of dhanni. Okay, we think this is what's the case. We're doing that. We, we're not 100% sure, but it seems to hit our heart, and this is what it is referring to. Okay, now let's listen to Sheikh Hassan uh, again. Uh, he said to me, what am I supposed to do with these thoughts? Am I supposed to throw them out? Am I supposed to throw them out? That's what he said. I mean, come on, let's have an academic. I was, I, I was expecting an academic response. I got no academic response from, from the Sheikh. And if any of you guys out there want me to have an academic, you know, sitting with him, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person, I'm ready for that. But an academic one. What I heard yesterday was, was clearly shocking. Sheikh said to him, I've got some of my notes here. Um, he said, what am I supposed to do? Shut my mouth and throw it away? That's what he actually said. You know, he said, I'm, he, he clearly said, he said, uh, he said, I looked at every tafsir on the jasad and I did not accept any of them. Uh, I have offered an explanation which no one has offered. So what am I supposed to do? He said, what am I supposed to do? Um, if you feel that what I'm saying is damaging to the ummah, then you have a duty to correct me in public. That's what the sheikh told me in the flesh. So here I am. That's why I'm brought to the, to the public domain. So um, this tafsir of this jasad, what is it? If you look in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll find uh, that uh, there's a hadith there that explains this. The hadith number uh, 2819, where Sulaiman said that he's going to go around all of his wives and that every single one of them will give birth to a child and then those children, he's going to send them in the path of Allah Azzawajal to fight in the path of Allah. Now his, his companion said to him, say inshallah, and Sulaiman did not say inshallah. Later on, only one wife gave birth to a child and that child was deformed and that deformed child was placed on his throne and Sulaiman then woke up to what he did and the Quranic ayah says, thumma anab, then he turned to Allah Azzawajal and in the next verse, it says he sought forgiveness from Allah Azzawajal and he asked for his great kingdom, which Allah bestowed you know, upon him and he gave gave to him now this is the tafsir of the ayah okay? okay so now let's analyze this and see uh where these two ideas can maybe interconnect so i'm going to let's look at this narration of the prophet وسلم, and understand this narration and that verse of the quran from this perspective okay uh i'm just going to read the english here okay Sulaiman said tonight Okay, I will go around with 100 women. Every one of them will deliver a male child who will fight in the cause of Allah. On that, the angel said to him, say if Allah will. But Suleiman did not say it and forgot to say it. Then he had relationship with them, but none of them delivered any child except one who delivered a half a person. Prophet Suleiman said, if Allah, the Prophet وسلم, said, if Suleiman had said, if Allah will, Allah would have fulfilled his above desire, okay, uh, and saying that he would have, uh, and he would have made him more hopeful. This is the hadith. So, first of all, just from, this is now a good example of a hadith 
that um, that you can understand sometimes when uh, you can say things contradict. Now, I'm all for hadith. I believe in hadith wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly, I believe in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu I completely trust the books of Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi. But then there are times where we have to also use our understanding and our mind. So either we are going to have to, if we question it and there's problems, we have we can either a try to find a solution to resolve them by merging things that make sense together, or we have to choose one over the other. Okay, if you can't, but so for example. Let me share with you what I mean. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that whoever touches his private part will lose wudu. It's a say hadith. The Prophet also said, it's just part of your body because a companion of the Prophet asked uh, about, you know, touching the private part. Now, some scholars resolve this by saying what? The first hadith is referring to if you touch your private parts without clothes. And the second one refers to when the companion was asking, he was referring to with the clothes on, you know. So he was able to bring two things together. Okay. So now having said this, let us now look and analyze this uh, hadith. Okay. Uh, Suleiman, the son of Daud, alayhi said, tonight I will go around. Uh, I will go around with 100 women, meaning his wives, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, he will spend the night with 100 wives. First of all, every human being knows that you cannot spend your night uh, with 100 wives, especially if you're going to give them their rights of their rights in their bed too, you know? Maybe if you're just taking your rights and it can be like one after the other. Uh, but if you're giving the wife her rights and you're also having your rights and giving her rights in bed, then this is not possible that you can do 100 women in a night. Okay. Number one, this is quite kind of logical. Okay. Number two, so now what? Now the other thing you can do to resolve this issue is to combine all, read all of the hadiths on this issue, and then see, okay, is there something that's missing in this narration that you can find in another narration to fix the picture, okay? But we're going to go based off of this and two or three maybe others, and just leave it at that, okay, without giving any judgment. So Suleiman, the son of Daud, said, tonight I will go around 100 of my wives, Every one of them will deliver a child who will fight in the cause of Allah. Okay. Uh, and then, Tulida kullu imra'atin wulama. So he makes a prediction that by me going to 100 women tonight, I'm going to have 100 children. Yuqatil fi sabilillah. And they will fight in the path of Allah. Faqala lahu malaku kul insha'Allah. So he, he, as a prophet, he makes a statement that's not completely true. And then the angel tells him to say, inshallah, and uh, inshallah, falam yaqul, he didn't say inshallah, and wa And you can say the reasoning for that is that he forgot to say, he forgot to say inshallah, wa So then what? Uh, so he went around to them. The word is literally nifsul insan. She didn't deliver anything except half a human. Except half a human. Nifsul insan. So even there, from a linguistic perspective, a lot can be said about what does it mean by nifsul insan, half a human. He was paralyzed. He was literally half a human being, or he was kind of like a human. Like anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Okay. And then the Prophet says, "Lo qala insha'Allah lam yatahannath." If he had said insha'Allah, his uh, his uh, he wouldn't have uh, fallen into this 
uh, you know, issue. Uh, now, let's look at two other narrations on the same issue so that we can uh, say Bukhari narrates Suleiman, Allah's Prophet Suleiman, who had 60 wives, said, once said, Tonight I will have sexual relations with all my wives, so each one of them will become pregnant and bring forth a boy who will grow into a cavalier and will fight in Allah's cause. So he slept with his wives. None of them conceived a child except one who brought a half-born, deformed baby. Okay. So you see different wordings, different hadiths, same story, different wordings. Over there it says 100, over here it says 60, okay? And uh, and then uh, the Prophet said, if Suleiman had said, if Allah wills, then each of these women would have delivered a, a person who would fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. In this hadith, it says shiq al gulam instead of nifsul insan. Okay, so he was a deformed human being. Uh, another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet said, the Prophet Suleiman said, tonight I will sleep with ninety women, each of whom will all bring forth a a fighter in the cause of Allah. On this, his friend said to him, inshallah, but he did not say it. He did not say inshallah. And Suleiman slept with all his wives, but none of them became pregnant except one, one who delivered him a, uh, again, shiq al-rajul, half a man, or yeah, a deformed man, by in whom whose hands Muhammad's soul is, if Suleiman had said, inshallah, they would have fought in the cause of Allah as cavaliers. Okay. Okay. So one narration says 60, one says 30, uh, one says 90, one says 60, one says 100. Okay. So, and it's also, it doesn't seem logical that one man would sleep with uh, even 60 women and also give them the rights. Also, it doesn't seem logical that a prophet of Allah would not say inshallah, which according to one narration, he just doesn't say it. And another narration, he forgot to say it. So if we bring it together, we may give the proper, the, always the interpretation should be the one that makes more sense uh, in the sense of positivity. So if somebody is, has a maqam of a Nabi of Allah, we'll never say he on purpose didn't say inshallah. That's not possible. Even if we think the hadith is weak, we still give it an interpretation that is the interpretation based upon what is more positive, especially for a prophet of Allah. Okay, But also in the same regard, it's not possible for a prophet of Allah to go to 60 wives in one night and give them all their rights. That's not possible. Uh, so there is, you can say, uh, the hadith is mutawatir. So we can't deny it. But again, it's not qat'i, right? It falls into the realm of dhanni. Now, we can ask ourselves, is there any link between these ayat and this hadith? Is there any link? Is there anything that shows there is a link between this hadith and this ayah? If you have a deformed baby, why are you going to put him over the throne? For what reason? He was so... Uh, desiring kingship that he wanted to take his baby and see if he'll fit in his, the throne? Like, first of all, you have the problem of saying this hadith even fits with this ayah. Besides the problems that exist with the hadith, and we don't deny it, but we don't confirm it because there's an ishkal, there's a problem. Okay. And if you say, okay, let's assume a prophet of Allah does it as a miracle. It was a miracle he went to all his wives, had intimacy with them. But if it was a miracle, it can't be a miracle if he forgot to say inshallah, right? B because you can't have a miracle while you're in doing something wrong as a prophet, right? The revelation, the divine revelation stopped to the prophet when he didn't say inshallah, right? So if inshallah 
the Pro Suleiman forgot to say inshallah in some event, then some help of Allah or some divine intervention of Allah was delayed. And during that time when Suleiman was in this state of having these relationships, now if you bring the two hadiths together, it is possible to say that while he was in this state of having relationships with his wives and he had forgotten to say inshallah, then it had consequences. And one of the consequences was that at that time, not only did he have this good intention and have, let's say, intimacy with his wives, and it wasn't necessarily one night, but it, he meant by tonight, meaning I'm going to start tonight and have relationships with my wives, all of them, because we always give a positive interpretation to the hadith. And then in that process, when he was in that state of wanting to produce these children in the cause of Allah, and because he forgot to say inshallah. So it is during that time that Suleiman perhaps saw this jasad on his chair and he became very worried. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the control of these things. But uh, as you know also, for those people who know history, Suleiman did have two sons and they inherited his kingdom, which became divided into two parts because of inner fightings that happened, which I'm not going to go into. Okay. So uh, the idea that you took a little baby from the home, from the mother's arm and put him on the throne questions the fact, is this hadith even related to this ayah? Is it even related to this verse of the Quran? So I'm not denying the hadith, but I'm saying that the hadith uh, is, if you're being critical of a hadith as a muhadith should be, as a faqih should be, uh, if it goes against uh, logic, if it goes, if it has inter-contradictions, then it has a problem. But again, we go towards the positive side. If this is true, then the explanation is that because he didn't say inshallah, and there were consequences of that, not only in his personal life, because as you know, deformed babies partly happen because of what? Because of the interference of the jinns. And the jinn plays with the uh, with the jinn plays with the, the the embryo to deform it or to cause problems to it. So it was a time that that the shayateen they had you can say uh, they were they were influencing having influence in the life of Sulaiman and at that time he also saw that vision that Allah gave him. Perhaps he was saying what's going on, and he wanted to. And when did this happen? When he wanted to fight in the, when he had the intention for his children to fight in the cause of Allah. So in that way, it becomes interconnected. And that's what we would like to uh, ultimately uh, do. Now. This is, this is it, the jasad. Now, Sheikh Iman Hussein gives his own interpretation that that, that jasad, look, we've got a hadith of Bukhari here. Okay? And Sheikh Iman saying that that jasad was, was the jal. Now, where did he get it from? I said, look, Sheikh, what about if, uh, you know, uh, so-and-so says that it was Iblis, that jasad, that body was Iblis. What about somebody else says that jasad and body was, let's say, the Daba min al-Ard, which is a creature, you know, on the earth that would appear before the Day of Judgment. What about if they say that? What about if somebody else says it's an alien? So he raises a good point here. So it is possible it could be any other jasad. Right. But why do we say, for example, it could be the Jal? We say that because if you understand the Jewish understanding of the Messiah. OK, the Jewish understanding of the Messiah and the occults, they all look to the kingdom of Suleiman, which the Quran mentions. Right. So uh, so let me just uh, show you the verse. So we're clear on this. I'm sure a lot of you already know this. But it's just a review for some of you. Uh, and that's okay. Because this will make your understanding of uh, the issues more clear. Both to and against. And keeping a balance between them. Okay. And what ma shayatinu ala mulki Sulaiman. And they followed what the devils taught them. Uh, over here, ala mulki Suleiman is translated as taught during the re reign of Suleiman. This is not the correct translation. 
They followed what talawa, recitation, or whatever, the shayateen did over or over the kingdom of Sulaiman. Why? Because this is what they wanted. That's the power that they wanted. That's what they desired. And when you connect this ayah with the ayah of the passage that talks about that, we gave what? An inspiration to who? We gave an inspiration to Sulaiman when we tested him. We tested Sulaiman and what? And we put a jasad on his chair. Now, this jasad that he saw made him turn to Allah immediately. Okay. Actually, not immediately because it has the word thumma instead of fa. Okay. Jasadan. Ala kursi jasadan. Thumma anab. Then after some time, when he saw that, you know, after the fitna, you can say, he turned towards Allah and he said, Allah, give me a kingdom no one else has, right? So, and then Allah gives him control of all these things. The point being that uh, there is a clear link between the shayateen, which includes Iblis, which includes the jal, the shayateen, the world of shayateen, and the kingdom of Sulaiman. So when Sulaiman saw this jasad on his chair, it is assumed that, uh, and, and also uh, just as a, as a point in, in all of this is what, that the Messiah, that the Jewish people envision as their Messiah, which is the Dajjal, he's going to have the kingdom of Sulaiman. Right, he's going to have the kingdom of Suleiman. So if he's going to have the kingdom in the area from the Nile to the Euphrates, the kingdom of Suleiman, and he'll take over all these lands, then he has to act and pretend like he's Suleiman. He has control over things the way Suleiman has. Okay, so let's continue, inshallah. I hope that's clear, inshallah. If anybody has any questions, then they can ask me. But let's... Do they have the right to say that? He said, every person has the right to... So it could be any jasad. But it's this jasad we call Dajjal because he's the one who is waiting to be the Messiah and the prophet. And he's going to come as, you know, the Messiah. And he's going to come as the person who sits in the seat of Suleiman. As you know, even till today in the museum in England, again, England, they have the throne of David there till today. You say that. La hawla wa la illa I was so shocked to hear this. So what he's saying is that, look, any part of the Quran... Any person sitting down thinks that this particular word means that without any of it, without any scholars. I said to him, look, no scholar. He said, yes, no scholar has said this before me. I'm the first scholar to say that. Again, it's not a big issue because it's not a it's not an issue of aqidah and it's not an issue of aqaid. It's not an issue of fiqh, fiqh. It's not about like, okay, like if Sheikh Imran Hussain said, we're doing four prayers instead of five, that's a problem. Obviously, if he said, we, I don't believe in the punishment of the grave, for example, that's a problem. OK. Uh, that's a problem. But if he's saying something that's never been said, but it doesn't contradict the aqaid, it doesn't contradict the fiqh. And he's giving you a clear methodology on which he's doing this using the Quran. Then there's, he could be right. He could be wrong. But it's. It is a clear methodology using the Quran as the text to which you're now discovering things that were never discovered before. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. And Sheikh Imran Hussain is not the first one to do this. Many great scholars of their times said things and discovered things that they never, that was never said before. I'll give you one example. The, earth, the sun, the moon, revol the, 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 the earth going around the sun or that the earth, the earth is rotating uh, is taken from the Quran first time by Muslim scholars, which was not an interpretation in the uh, in the uh, in the early tafsirs. They said the earth is flat. Some of the mufassirin said the earth is flat, but later on they said no, the earth isn't flat. So this is not an, an issue of aqidah. It's not an issue of fiqh Islamic law that where things are fixed, but still most of that, some of that is qatai, but most of it's under lanni. This is an issue about ayyamullah, the days of Allah, how they're changing. And this is about understanding the times that we live in. This has nothing to do. So if somebody says, for example, this jasad was dabatul ard, 
wouldn't necessarily be wrong from a purely interpretational point of view, but it would be wrong because it doesn't make all the connections. And that is that the Dajjal will come as the, the, the Messiah, which is Isa, right? And he will come as the par excellence of, of the kingdom of Suleiman, where he will show he has control of magic, his control of the jinns. You know, he was going to show, look, I'm, the, I'm obviously a prophet. I make the jinns go away. I make, you know, the winds move. I control the weather, all this, okay? So now, uh, let's continue. And he said, I have a right to say that. What do you want me to do with it? Throw it out? That's what he said to me. And when I said to him, what about if the whole ummah, you know, different people of the ummah say, say, he said they have the right to, and that right must not be denied from them. I mean, are you listening to what this means? This means that anyone can say anything about it. I think what he means, and, if you, and this is the other problem that's happened here, is that um, the other problem that has happened here is that they're looking at one lecture and only one like clip. Okay. Sheikh Imran was saying, how many times those of us that have listened to him over and over and over again, how many times does Sheikh Imran Hussain say, use the word Quranic methodology? He's not saying just anyone come up with anything. Obviously, no scholar will say that. What he's saying is that if you're using my method, just like if you're a Hanafi and you use the Hanafi method, I'm using the Hanafi method, but coming to a different conclusion. The method is the same. The asuns of the fiqh are the same, but the conclusion is different. That happens. Somebody can use the same methodology Sheikh Imran Hussain is using and come to a different conclusion. Okay? So that is very possible. Okay. So now, uh, he doesn't mean literally anybody. Uh, I think that's uh, kind of obvious. The Quran and Hadith, and you know, they have a thought about what it means. They can say it. What will that do to our religion if that continues? This is the area of concern. I hope all of you followers of Sheikh Imam Hussein look, apart from the 90% of the things that I'm not contending, and I'm not saying you know they're wrong because he's giving you he's giving you um uh he's giving you historical facts, so I'm not contending any of that. But this part where he said this means this, and I have a right for this, and there's nothing to back it up. You're going to just accept it? La ilaha illallah. Okay, let's move on. Okay, something greater than this. There's an ayah of the Quran, uh, 4361. Surah 43, ayah 61. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِسَعَى It talks about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, that he is لَعِلْمٌ He is the knowledge of the hour. Now, I'm going to share a video uh, with this with this video, a link of a video where, he, where Sheikh clearly says, okay, and I brought this up with him yesterday when I met him. Sheikh says, لِسَاعَدَ He's the knowledge of the hour means that Isa knows the, the, the when the hour will be. Now this is a very clear mistake of the Sheikh because if you look in the tafsir, it says Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My brothers and sisters, okay. yes I am here to Does somebody have the other part to this? Part two? Do we have the part two for this? Let me see can somebody give me the part two to this? To this video? Okay, let me try that. Let's talk about uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein. And some of you will say, well, why don't I meet him in private and so on? Yes, I met him. Uh, after several years of listening to his claims, many of his claims, which I felt some of those claims were Sheikh says he's the knowledge of the hour, means that Isa knows the, the, the when the hour will be. Now this is a very clear mistake of the Sheikh because if you look in the tafsir, it says which means when Isa will come we will know that the hour is dawning upon us. The hour is near to us. That's what it means. Okay, that's what the tafsir is mentioned. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, according to a Sahih hadith, that. Uh, so yes, so the tafsir they mention different things. Uh, since you are students of knowledge, let me actually share that with you. Uh, in Surah Zuhruf, and I did a whole talk on this, as you know. But I'm going to 
summarize some of the points. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I number 61. Wa and he is, or it is. Who is referring to the who, the who in Arabic. The who is referring to either a he or an it. What is it referring to? If you look above, okay, it refers to Maryam and then Musa. But what is interesting is within this surah itself, in ayah number 44, innahu is referring to the Quran. Innahu dhikrun laka wa liqawmika. Innahu it is, meaning the Quran is. The who is referring to the Quran, is going back to the book of Allah. The who, okay, it is, is referring to what? This is the question, okay? Now, uh, where is it? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Wa innahu la'ilmu sa'ah. And it, this Quran is the knowledge of the hour. Meaning in this Quran is the knowledge of the hour. Is one meaning of the ayah. Wa innahu la'ilmu sa'ah is referring to possibly Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Indeed, he is the knowledge of the hour because the Prophet says between me and the day of judgment is like these two fingers. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ السَّعَةِ Also means, إِنَّهُ he is لَعِلْمٌ And then mahzuf something that's said in, in the sentence without saying it. عَلَامَةُ السَّعَةِ قُرْبُ لِلسَّعَةِ Okay. إِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ لِلسَّعَةِ Okay. So we understand that. So, إِنَّهُ can refer to the Qur'an. It can refer to Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Because why? Because Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is mentioned over here. In ayah number 63. Okay. He's not directly, you can say, too much mentioned up here. Because Musa and, uh, Musa and Isa are mentioned together. Okay. Okay. So here. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلِئِهِ فَقَالَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ رسول إِنِّي رَسُولُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ فَلَمَّا جَاءُمْ بِآيَاتِنَا so they were laughing at them. And then it continues. And then, and then, uh, you know, the prophets are saying, you have to obey us. And the, when the son, uh, when the example of the son of, uh, son of Maryam is given, okay, to your people, meaning, oh, prophet, to your people, they also laugh at him at that uh, at, at the prophet at that time then allah says wa innahu and you're laughing at him and the prophet muhammad or you're laughing about jesus wa innahu la ilmu he is the knowledge of the hour this is one but no one translates this as knowledge of the hour so then how do we understand this from sheikh imran hussein's perspective okay let me uh, very quickly uh, reference something because I, I did a whole talk on this maybe some of you heard it but it's okay if we go over it again uh, and then let me so uh, this for example this stuff here also says uh, meaning okay uh, by which you'll know that the hour is near okay so he's saying there's another kira. Who is this kira by? This kira is by Abdullah bin Abbas, عنه, who is the Hebrew Ummah. He's the rabbi of the Ummah. There can be no tafsir without his, uh, you can say, help. Uh, he, is, he says the, that the other kira that helps you understand what the ayah means, because Ibn Abbas عنه, had two opinions. The first opinion he had is this refer, ayah is referring to Isa alayhi It's not referring to the Quran. It's not referring to Prophet Muhammad. 
Because the first question you have to answer is, who is this it? Who is this he or it? Who is that? Okay. If it is referring to Prophet Muhammad, if it is referring to Prophet Muhammad, then it makes more sense in terms of the way we read it today. Meaning that what we, when I say read it today in the Qiraatul Amma, the normal recitation that is well known throughout the Muslim world, that is the Quran and is the word of Allah. Okay. But Sheikh Imran Hussein is looking at it from a perspective of Islamic eschatology. So he's thinking from that perspective, and I'm going to come to that. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ السَّعَى could also mean the Qur'an it has the knowledge of the hour. That's also okay. But because Isa والسلام, is specifically referred to, and many times the Qur'an seems to do this, is that when there is a difference of qira, okay, when there's a difference of recitation, and we did this with Surah Yasin, right? Yes, uh, when it said, تَنزِيلَ لَلْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ تَنزِيلُ لَلْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ if you take this in its both of its qira to be correct, then innahu la'ilmu sa'a is the general uh, qira and it connects more with what was before it. Okay? And it then refers to innahu la'ilmu sa'a will connect more with what? That this is the Quran that has the knowledge of the hour because it tells you about the day of judgment. If you say in the Qira of Ibn Abbas, it connects more with the ayahs coming after. And what you'll find is a lot of times that these variations of Qira happen in ayat that are interlockers between the subject that's on top of the ayat and the subjects that are on the bottom of the ayat. You'll find a lot of times this interlocker uh, between them. Okay. So first of all, the Prophet allowed both Qira's. What Sheikh Imran is saying is not, he's not saying that uh, who is right and who is wrong. This is not what he's trying to say. Because if you know his methodology is, he always looks at the different qira's. He's been doing this for years. He looks at the different qira's, okay? So because he looks at the different qira's, uh, he's just simply saying, وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَّامَةِ السَّعَى It makes more sense from the perspective of Islamic eschatology. It makes more sense if it's referring to Isa والسلام, in this manner, in terms of this is the opinion of Ibn Abbas, and it fits better with Islamic eschatology. Okay. Now, he's not saying, of course, that the Quran is wrong. Okay. When he's talking about the uh, the marks, the diametrical, the marks, what he's simply saying is that you don't see when you're looking at the Quran that we have the Qiraatul Amma, the normal Qira, we don't see the, the, the marks, right? But he's, but he maybe didn't explain it thoroughly uh, for various reasons. He's also getting older, as you know. So, but when we look at his other speeches in which he's talked about the same subject with this speech, then it is clear that he's not saying anything wrong. It may be in that particular clip where it didn't come out in the best way, what he was really doing as a methodology, okay? So let's go back to uh, Sheikh Hassan Ali. A multi, he said, my own death is a sign of the last hour. When Isa Alaihissalam will come, we'll know that he's also a sign of the last hour. Now, Sheikh says it should be read La'alamun Lisa'a, which is one of the narrations from Ibn Abbas or the Allah Anhumah. Now, this is not the area of concern. The area of concern, the big area of concern, I hope all of you listen to this. Sheikh said... In and if Sheikh Hassan hears this video of mine, I want to be very clear. This is not, absolutely not what Sheikh Imran Hussein meant. There's no way in the world that he means by it that the Quran that we have is not Quran and there have been like some sort of there's a mistake in it. This is not what he means. Okay. What he means is the Quran is the whole of the Quran, including its variant readings. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me just continue now. In that video, and he he clearly is still on that right now. 
Sheikh says that the people who wrote the diacritics of the Quran later on, so you know, we got the Quran from Rasulullah, the Sahab basically had the Quran, Abu Bakr wrote the Quran and he got it written, and then you know, they when there were no marks of uh, Fatah Dama Kasra on the Quran, right? Then the people read it in its variant forms because there was no restriction. You have to say a or e or u. Okay. So the ayah in Nahu Sa'a and in Nahu Sa'a, they can be both read looking at the just the letters. You can read both ways. But once you put the Fatah Dama Kasra, you've restricted the person and how he'll read it, and he's then not aware of its other meanings. Okay. So. Did that, and then Osman of the Allah made several copies of it, and then later on the diacritics were added onto that after Osman of the Allah. Sheikh says when those Fathah Dhamma Kasa were added on, somebody or La Alamul Sa'ad, they deliberately or intentionally or unintentionally, mistakenly, they made it La Alamul Sa'ad and it's a mistake. Okay, it was a mistake. And Sheikh says this is a mistake, which means that for 1400. This is where the big misunderstanding is for some reason that the Sheikh is saying that uh, we had it wrong all this time. It should have been this. No. See, Islamic scholars have always debated, including Imam Sayyuti, including many great scholars, which qira uh, is preferred to them. Like, I like this qira. I, I prefer this qira without denying any of the qira because they're all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So that's as far as that is concerned. Let's go back. I'm not here to defend Sheikh Imran Hussain. I want. 100 years, more or less. I wanted to talk more about, instead of what he feels or what he's saying, more what is his methodology, okay? So let's just listen to this. All the scholars, all the people, the entire ummah has been reading this, this ayah wrong. That's what the sheikh is saying, that we shouldn't accept that. And I said to him, why don't you accept this? He's this problem has never occurred in any of his lectures ever until he was in London. And... Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of things going on in London, but uh, I just want this to be clear that uh, that um, this doesn't make sense what is being portrayed, that he say that as if he doesn't believe in part of the Quran or the Quran had a mistake all these years. We always have a good opinion about other people, and the good opinion is until absolutely proven otherwise that Sheikh Imran Hussain does not hold the opinion that the Quran was changed uh, to cover, it, or, or the innahu la ilmu sa'a is the wrong kira, and the other is the only right kira. If he said that, that would be problematic. He said because it's in contradiction with the rest of the Quran. That's what he says. Because of his view that it means that Isa alayhi salam knows uh, when the last hour will, will come. And I said, Sheikh, that's not what the ayah means. I even pointed out towards the tafsir. And I said, look, this tafsir says, this tafsir says, you know, it means this, just that he's, he's one of the signs of the last hour. Sheikh said, well, well, you know, he clearly said to me, when I said to him that, look, this is mutawatir. This is something, this la ilmul lisa, the way we've got written in the Quran. Guys, this is your Quran. This is your holy Quran. I hope you're waking up to this. Because what Sheikh Imran is saying is that you, you've been reciting the Quran wrong. That ayah is wrong. All the ummah, including all the scholars from the, you know, Tabirin time or, you know, whenever the diacritical marks were placed in till today, everyone got it wrong. I mean, can you imagine? That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the variant readings of the Quran are not known because of the markings that we have in the Qira of Hafs particularly. Okay. Yes, absolutely. The variant re readings are a, uh, a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt. I totally 100% believe that. I believe in the variant readings as part of the Quran and the Qira of Hafs, which is the Qira al Amma, as also reading of the Quran. What, what this, this is blasphemy. This is absolute blasphemy. This is, even, this is kufr. This is disbelief. If you deny the, all the uh, scholars agree, if you deny a verse or a part of a verse of the Quran, 
then you have gone out of the fall of Islam. Therefore, I'm going to ask kindly, I'm going to ask Sheikh Imam Hussain to do Toba and to say that Laimul Lisa'a is a correct part of the Quran, that it is correct in its meaning, in, in the way it's written, in the way we pronounce it as Laimul, it is correct because we've been pronouncing it like that for 1400 years. Sheikh says to me, when I said to him, look, this is a successive transmission of the Quran that you're denying. And the Sheikh said to me, yes, I am. Even if it is mutawatir, I reject it because it is in conflict with the rest of the Quran. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So here you go. Look, you, you, the followers of, you know, the Sheikh who's saying that Sheikh is so and so. Look, he's denying a part of the Quran. He's going to say, Sheikh has said in the video, look, I'm not denying part of the Quran. Well, because even though you're, you're, so the Sheikh says in the video, I'm not denying part of the Quran. So we should have a good opinion about our brothers and try to understand what they're saying in the context of what they're saying. You can read it according to Ibn Abbas but you can't say that the Ummah, the rest of the Ummah has got it wrong when they recite that's a mistake because you're saying that it was interjected deliberately or not deliberately. However, your, I mean, can you, can you imagine what this means? This means that all the other Arabs around at the time, when they saw the diacritical mark, they never made a hoo-ha. Guess what? The whole of the history of Islam has been silent on this. That's what it means. That the, the entire Ummah just suddenly a Quran appeared. Imagine, imagine this, right? Because Sheikh knows very well, and he said it in the video, that the Arabs never needed the diacritical marks. So the Arabs were memorized and they recited La Ala according to the Sheikh, okay? Suddenly there's a writing that says La Ala and the Arabs had no problem with it. They just carried on reciting La Ilmulisa. Every Arab in the whole of the Islamic world at that time, the whole Islamic empire, not a single Arab rejected to this. Can you believe that? And a mistake was inserted and we've been carrying on reading that mistake until today. I mean, this is kufr. This is disbelief. This takes one out of the fall of Islam. And if you also believe what the Sheikh said, it will take you out of the fall of Islam. This is not me saying this, guys. Look, this is not me. This is everything. Look, this is Hanafi, this is Maliki, this is Shafi, this is Hanbali, this is Athari, this is Maturi, this is Ashari. This is the Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah in its totality. This is every group you can think of under Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah. All the Sunni groups will all say that if you reject a verse or a part of the verse of the Quran, this is Kufr, this is disbelief, you go out of the fall of Islam. So I'm going to ask Sheikh to do Tawbah, to make repentance, uh, and I'm going to ask him to correct this obvious. Uh, and look, uh, regarding his other beliefs, because he said to me very clearly that, um, you know, he has the right to this, and all scholars have a right to make their thoughts and conjecture about the uh, about the Quran. Or the, you know, the okay, so two points here. Look, the first is that the Quran says, لا يأتيه no falsehood can enter Quran. That's the whole premises of Islam. So, of course, if anyone denies even a letter of Quran, they're kafir because you're saying something that's part of because the that's the qatai, right? That's the absolute that can never ever change. That's like la ilaha illallah. That is like jannah. That is like the hellfire that can never change. If somebody said, oh, the Quran has a mistake in it and has had a mistake in it for 1,400 years, that person's a kafir. But what I'm saying is that's not what Sheikh Imran Hussain is saying. He's saying because the different variant readings are not well known. I'm saying it in my words, what he's saying. So this aspect of this gira, that this ayah is number one, referring to Isa, according to Ibn Abbas. And number two, that this particular one reading makes more sense if it is referring to Isa والسلام, and once we put the Fatah Dama Kasra people became unaware of the variant readings and now find it strange like what's this variant reading you know why do they you know kalla innal insana layatgha versus kalla innal insana layatghi ara'ahu istaghna becomes becomes right so these types of changes in kira where the vowels are or the changes in the wordings the different kiras right he did not say there's a mistake in the quran and people he's talking about the effect of having kiraatul amma which is jaiz which is haq meaning the, the, nor the normal reading of the majority. 
But what happened is now we've become unaware of the variant readings of Quran, which has different shades of Allah's mercies and blessings. And this is the this is what he's trying to. Uh, yeah. And so this is the other point. Very good point that one brother raised. So why is he even making this an issue? That innahu la ilmu sa'a versus innahu la alamatu sa'a because the people that deny the coming back of Isa salam based upon the hadith literature, then this becomes a clear proof against them because they're denying the hadith of the Prophet. So it's actually what he's trying to do is trying to prove what the Prophet said about the coming back of Isa is true using a different variant reading. And he's saying, look. These markings that you have today is not the whole of the qira of the Quran. There are other qira'ats of the Quran that have give different variant meanings that like Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim, like we have in our Sutum Yasin class, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim, Tanzil al-Aziz al-Rahim, for example. And there are many hundreds and hundreds of examples throughout the Quran where there's variant readings you don't see those variant readings. And when you find out about the variant re readings, you find it strange. And those people who deny the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, I don't know what that means. Who is MD? Uh, I don't know who MD is referring to. Uh, what is MD? Um, but uh, so that's what he's emphasizing that Isa Islam will come back and this is a Quran that does show so. Okay. And to have the different Quran's, you need to accept Hadith. And to accept the different Quran's is accepting the whole of Quran. Okay, the whole of Quran with its variant readings. Okay, you don't see those variant readings because of the markings. This is the point he's making. And so I think he's been misunderstood. And because he's been misunderstood, it's very important for people that have been listening to him that they should be very clear what he's actually saying. Because what he's saying is not based upon one speech. It's based upon his writings and based upon hundreds of his other speeches. Right. He didn't, you know, Sheikh Imran Hussein is very consistent in what he says. He talks about the same topics, says the same things over and over again. So he didn't come up with something new all of a sudden, uh, just out of the blue. Right. Uh, so in the end, before we end, I want to say that Sheikh Hassan Ali, he's very pious, very muttaqi, very scholarly. And uh, he has more taqwa than me, more scholarship than me. Uh, and he follows the sunnah of Nabi Muhammad وسلم, more than me. But I think, honestly, because of maybe people that were going to him, uh, he has been used to speak against Sheikh Imran Hussein. And uh, I think Sheikh Imran Hussein was already agitated. And uh, he probably, at his level, honestly, though, probably didn't feel that the right questions were being asked. And I've seen this happen with many scholars. That if you ask questions from uh, what to one person may seem like condescending or like, why are you wasting my time? Uh, then people tend to give dismissive answers. And Allah knows best. But I do know that uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Hassan Ali is a pious uh, Muslim, a righteous Muslim. Uh, and I also know that Sheikh Imran Hussein is a pious and a righteous Muslim. And none of them, or both of them, do not deny the Quran. Both of them accept the Quran completely and fully. But this is a good example of how uh, we get divided. Uh, this is a good example of how uh, miscommunication happens. This is a good example of how um, we uh, form an allergic reaction 
uh, even allergic reaction, you can say, to one another. So may Allah guide us and may Allah help uh, uh, those people that uh, are opposing uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein with the wrong intentions and with uh, dubious intentions because they, we, I know for a fact they are. And Sheikh Hassan Ali is not one of them, which is one of the things that surprised me about this whole situation. So there are people trying to undermine Sheikh Imran Hussein, and it's as that simple. And so when you hear something, as you have been hearing some negative things, uh, we what is it the Quran tells us to do? You know, it's min husn al Islam al mar'i tarku ma la yaanihi. And so uh, I would wish also that one day there's a propaganda against me, uh, people start from the perspective of what and that uh, no we're maybe misunderstanding something let's figure this out rather than oh he did say this well then you know forget about everything else he said and everything else he did uh, that's a shame so uh, I know that uh, Sheikh Hassan Ali probably had good intentions because he feels that somebody's on the verge of leaving Islam and he needs to warn the people uh, but I believe also that he, Sheikh Hassan Ali, was being used by others to make the statement. Uh, and then, you know, the meeting didn't go tremendously well for whatever reasons. Um, but I know how a scholarly Sheikh Imran Hussein can be. And I know that Sheikh Hassan Ali is a scholar. So there's been clearly um, a, a breakdown of communication. Um, at, probably there was a breakdown of communication before even uh, Sheikh Hassan Ali had entered the room. So, so basically, in both of them, the Innahu seems to refer to the Quran because Innahu in the first ayah, uh, 40, I think 41, Innahu is referring to the Quran. So the different Qira then shows that it's also, at least, also referring to not only Qur'an, but also Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is a smack in the face for the people that deny the hadith literature. This is the point, that there is a kira that allows, that clearly says, he is the sign of the hour. Okay, so I'll end here as far as the recording is concerned. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad.